when I was making Shaun of the Dead, it wasn't so much of a problem because I was lucky that I got to make it with a lot of my friends and people who were in that movie were people that I'd been working with, you know, for, for years at that point and were and, and was very good friends with, like Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, Pete Serevenovich, Jessica Hines and more. I guess when we were doing Hot Fuzz, then like there were a lot of kind of like um, people who I was, you know, big fans of that were in the movie. And I guess you sort of just have to get over that hump. Um, you know, in Hot Fuzz alone, there's Billy Whitelaw, Edward Woodward, Timothy Dalton, and like many others. And, um, you know, maybe a lot of that nervousness or, or just the thing of meeting them for the first time, you can kind of get that out of your system when you have a general meeting with them or through the rehearsal process. That said, we would, and apologies to Timothy Dalton, but me, Simon and Nick would make the same joke every time Timothy Dalton left a room. We'd go, you know who that was? That was James Bond. We would say that joke every time. So apologies to Timothy, but we were just starstruck by you, Timothy. I mean, prior to that, actually prior to Shaun of the Dead, when I was working as a TV director, when I was very young, in my early 20s, I worked with a lot of TV stars who I had grown up watching, and that was really surreal. So I worked with French and Saunders and Alexi Sale and these people, and even in the French and Saunders episode that I did, Joanna Lumley was in it and Helen Mirren was in it. And I was 24 at the time, so that was kind of crazy. So I guess the way of dealing with that was that it's not dissimilar to how to tackle with imposter syndrome is the only real way to deal with it is just know the answers to all of the questions. So if you're like a young director on a shoot working with people who are much more experienced, like have an answer for everything. Know, know what you want to do and, uh, and be able to make decisions quickly. What you don't want to do is like arm and err about decisions and then you can bet any money that an actor or one of the crew will be whispering, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. So know what you're doing, even if you're bluffing it, <laughs> like have an answer for everything. I have many favorite movies, but there are certain movies that I watched when I was thinking about being a director that really inspired me. And usually they were ones that were mind expanding in some way or really playing with the form that made me excited about what you could do in a film. Around the time that I decided I really wanted to be a filmmaker, I was always interested in film. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. But around the time I decided filmmaking is what I want to do, there were two movies that I saw on VHS around that time. One was Sam Raimi's Evil Dead 2, and one was the Coen Brothers Raising Arizona, both released in the same year, in, in the USA, released on the same day, which is really crazy. Now, within those two movies, as such an amazing Pandora's box of every single cinematic trick in the book, that you feel with both movies that the directors are having such a blast at playing with the possibilities of what you could get away with in a film. I'll focus on those two movies because I feel like they encompass so much in the terms of like cinematic tricks and artistry in these wildly different films. Those were films that really inspired me and I thought, oh my God, how do you make a film like that? And the answer to that question is what leads you into being a filmmaker, is you want to figure out how the hell you make a film like that. There have been lots of other films along the ways that I've loved and, and, and usually there are ones that like have more than one thing going on. American Wealth in London is another one of my favorite films. And that's a film I saw when I was 10 years old and and at that time, I couldn't really conceive of how everything was in one movie. Like that movie, it's a horror film that's scary and really like frightening and gory. It's also a comedy that's really funny. It also has characters that are really sympathetic and you care about them. You don't want them to die. And then also it has an amazing soundtrack. And that was probably one of the first films that I saw where the use of pop music within the film as counter scoring was really striking and really impactful. These are all films that hit me at a, a, a formative time. There are other films that have become favorites of mine that I've started to grow in my estimation. Like maybe when I first saw 2001 A Space Odyssey on TV, panned and scanned, um, obviously 2001 on the TV is like, maybe you're not seeing it at its full potential, 
but it was still like a movie to obsess over. And that's a movie that then with successive viewings on a big screen, you start to realize this is one of my favorite films of all time. The Good, The Bad and The Ugly would be the same case. The Good, The Bad and The Ugly is incredible on a big screen, but it also, it still works on a TV. You know, I'm not gonna be kind of so snooty to say, oh, if you haven't seen The Good, The Bad and The Ugly on a big screen, you haven't seen it at all. I saw it on TV when I was 12 and then I thought it was amazing. These are just some of the films I saw at a very impressionable age and ones that were very formative to me. And I have many, many other favorite films, but those films that kind of made me want to be a filmmaker are still films that I return to and still films that get me excited about working in film. And the fact that that excitement has never gone away is something that's really important to me. I think that you'll know when a script is finished, in inverted commas, in your gut. You'll know that you, at a certain point, you have to stop writing or rewriting something and show it to somebody so they can read it. Now, when I say finished, in inverted commas, is a script is never really finished because you might have something that everybody likes and they want to make, but you might rewrite things during the rehearsal process. Things might change on the day of filming. And people always say that the editing is the last draft of the movie, where you can cut stuff out, you can add stuff. In a way, the post-production is the final draft of the movie. And I've certainly found ways that we can rewrite something after the fact, after we've shot something. I think as well, when you're writing a script, you don't want to have something that's kind of too long. I think if you were like a first-time screenwriter, and you handed in a script that was 150 pages long, people would raise their eyebrows because it's definitely a very bold statement to say, here's my 150 page script. Now, obviously, if you're making an epic and you're a more established writer, director or a writer, you could get away with something like that. But I think if you're writing your first script, being succinct and telling the story in a way that's both impactful, but also efficient is a good way to go. I certainly, I'm always a bit put off when I receive scripts that feel overwritten. And if I find it off-putting as a director, then a producer almost certainly will. They may not even finish reading the script. So I think if you're a new writer getting your script out to somebody, make sure that it's as concise as it can possibly be. Because writing a screenplay is different from writing a novel. Even if you're writing an epic, less is always more. I, I've done different processes for different films. And sometimes it's about watching as many films in that genre as possible. And sometimes it's about watching films in a different genre to the one you're making. So a couple of cases in point. With Shaun of the Dead, myself and Simon Pegg thought that we wouldn't re-watch the zombie films. We felt that we knew the zombie films and what we wanted to watch more of were films that we liked structurally and those included films like Back to the Future or Raising Arizona or Gremlins or uh, Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. And we also tried to kind of like break down the films in terms of like a three act structure, favorite films that we liked. The other thing we did watch was romantic comedies because in a way, Shaun of the Dead is a zombie film. We don't consider it a spoof of zombie films. If it is a spoof of anything, it's a spoof of romantic comedies. So we did watch some of those and thought about the tropes that exist in those films and how you could put them into a zombie film. With something like Hot Fuzz, there were two elements to it. One was that it felt it wouldn't be wrong to watch every cop movie ever made. Simon watched a lot, but I may have watched close to like 100 cop movies before Hot Fuzz. But to the point where all of the cliches of cop movies start to kind of like come to you by osmosis. I couldn't like pinpoint any one thing in any one film because so many films are similar to each other and you're just trying to figure out the different cliches within cop movies and then find out ways to subvert them. But on top of that, the other big aspect of Hot Fuzz is that we did real research with the police. So we did firsthand research as well. And that was something that's just worth its weight in gold. We interviewed police in London, and we went on a little mini tour of 
rural police stations out in the country. We went into kind of um, Somerset and Gloucestershire and Wiltshire and interviewed many police officers in the areas where the film was going to take place. And those interviews that we did and the transcriptions that we had of it were just an absolute gold mine of amazing details, turns of phrase, sometimes specific stories. So some of the silliest stuff in Hot Fuzz is from real interviews. Something like Scott Pilgrim didn't really like need any research, but myself and Michael Bacall watched a lot of teen movies and we were looking for specific lines in teen movies that could equate to action films. So we had like a list made of lines from teen movies that would also work in an action film. And so we started to break down the dialogue of those movies. Something like The World's End came more from personal experience of me and Simon. Um, and then Baby Driver was sort of a bit of both. I watched a lot of crime movies, not just contemporary ones, but going back to the classic film noir um, thrillers of the 40s. But on top of that, I also did research with ex-cons, people who had actually been bank robbers and getaway drivers. And of course, that was invaluable. At a certain point, one of those um, ex-cons, a guy called Joe Lawyer, became the technical consultant on the film. In the case of Last Night in Soho, which is a film that partly takes place in 60s London and is also a psychological thriller, I didn't really re-watch too many of my favourite psychological horror films because I felt like I knew them and I wanted to be inspired by my memory of those films. I watched psychological thrillers that I'd never seen before and horror films that I'd never seen before. But maybe more crucially for this particular film, I focused in on a lot of 60s dramas that weren't genre films at all. They were dramas of the time dealing with issues of the time and specifically British ones. And that was a very interesting thing because you can see how people talked in those films, what the costumes are like, what the hair is like, if they're shooting on location, what London in the mid 60s actually looked like and see it on screen, you know, as a form of archive. And that was endlessly fascinating, even if the films had nothing to do with Last Night in Soho. I mean, also with that film, we did a lot of research and I actually hired an amazing researcher called Lucy Pardy, who interviewed people who worked in Soho at the time, people who work in Soho now, people who were former prostitutes, people who were working prostitutes, and then to cover other aspects of the film, um, fashion students who were studying in London and people who were coming to London to study from the country and what a, a huge shift that was to move to a big city. We spoke to vice police as well. And we also kind of did lots of research into the crime from the time. All of this stuff was invaluable and it's such a sort of a huge wealth of information, literally like a phone book of research, that you could probably make a hundred different movies from that. But it was always great to have that as a resource and something that you could constantly refer to if you were stuck on ideas or you wanted to find some interesting details or something that could spark another kind of part of the story or another detail. That said, you don't have to research anything if you're writing a movie. If your movie is coming straight from your brain onto the page, then great, it's entirely up to you. I think the way to fight your corner on an idea that you feel very strongly about, but maybe others don't, is you, you just have to kind of, you just have to prove it somehow. For example, with Hot Fuzz, there was a scene in it, if you've seen the movie, you know the scene, where Simon Pegg's character, like karate kicks a granny in the face. And we had shot the scene, but on the day of the shoot, we had, the sun had gone down and we were missing a few key shots that would punch it up. And so I managed to convince Eric Fellner, the producer, to let me shoot a couple of days of little pickup shots before we showed it to an audience. Because I knew this scene was going to be good, but I knew what was missing was a shot that gave it real impact. And it's unusual to do reshoots or pickups before an audience has ever seen it. But I really knew in my gut that this scene would be better with one more shot. And the shot was literally a close-up of a shoe 
hitting the old lady in the face. And so I, I managed to convince Eric, I said, I really need this shot. I think it's really, really important to punch up the scene because at the moment it's all in wides and what it's missing is a shot of the shoe. So we managed to do on a very, very small budget, a couple of pickup days, maybe like a day and a half. I don't even think we had Simon Pegg. He wasn't available, but we didn't need him. We could shoot with a double. And in fact, the shot of the shoe going into the granny's face was the old Jackie Chan Hong Kong trick of a shoe and a trouser leg on a stick and the actress just kind of going like that. I think we might have even done it backwards. So you kind of have, you know, the foot in the face and then you pull back and then you reverse it. So it looks like it goes into somebody's face really hard. Anyway, cut to the first test screening of the movie. That bit, that shot brings the house down. It's easily the biggest laugh in the entire movie. People are laughing for five minutes afterwards. And me and Eric turn to each other and go, <laughs> thumbs up. But that's the thing is like, if something is like really important, the only way that you can prove it is to somehow do it. And that might mean working out of hours, that might mean scrabbling and saying to somebody, hey, I really need to get this shot. How can we do it? But I don't think you can prove those things theoretically. You just have to find a way to prove that it works and the audience will always be the ultimate litmus test. It's a difficult one to answer that because I don't sit down with a blank page and think what's a good story. Usually how a film comes to me is like a situation or a character in a situation and how that could develop. So in the case of Baby Driver, that was an idea that developed from a song and a car chase together in my head. And then the idea that the driver is listening to the song. And then the idea that the driver cannot do anything without the right song playing. So it was a sort of an idea that developed and then you start to think of what that story could be. If that was the first scene, then what journey does that character go on? You know, with Shaun of the Dead, it was obvious that we were gonna have a character who was like me and Simon in our late 20s, who was going to go on a journey during a zombie apocalypse. But the journey was an emotional one. It's about him stepping up and not being an adolescent anymore. An idea for a premise is usually based around a character and their journey. And that journey can be within the genre that you want to tell, or the journey can be kind of separate from the genre. It could be a genre film with something more personal happening within it. I think the nice thing about writing comedy and having written with uh, writers who have an appreciation for the form in the same way that I do, like Simon Pegg or Joe Cornish or Michael Bacall, the great thing about writing jokes is that anything could be a joke. It could be a verbal joke. It could be a visual joke. It could be a joke in the audio. It could be a joke in the editing. And so that's the fun part of it is that you're not limited to words on a page. And sometimes the joke can be the contrast of what the dialogue is, depending on what's happening in the scene or what's happening in the background of a scene. And I think in a way, like what's fun about some of the movies that we've done is that you're looking for ways to pack every frame with jokes or details. I like films and TV shows as well, where they withstand multiple viewings. So if you can pile them with lots of detail and extra things going on that you might not notice until a second or third or a fourth watch, I think that's great. As long as you can enjoy the movie on a first watch and then and then it becomes the gift that keeps on giving. I guess the key to any successful movie, or certainly a successful movie for me, is a synthesis of the two. You have your artistic intentions of something that you would like to do, but also really you've got to engage the audience. And I say engage rather than entertain, but like if the audience aren't engaged with what you're doing, then you've lost. So really, most of the movies I've made is an attempt to fuse the two. It's like the artistic or stylistic intentions of what I'm trying to do, but also on a commercial level, you're trying to engage the audience. And if you can do both at the same time, fantastic.
In my films, 99% of the songs that you hear have already been picked before we start filming. And usually they've been cleared before we start filming because what you absolutely don't want to do is film a scene with a song that you don't know whether you can clear or not. And many people making their first movies are suddenly stuck with a scene revolving around a Led Zeppelin track, which they cannot afford. <laughs> so don't fall into that trap. I mean, what I tend to do is two things. Sometimes a, a, a song will inspire a scene. Bell Bottoms by the John Spencer Blues Explosion was basically the entire impetus for Baby Driver. It was in hearing that song that I started to think of that scene. In other cases, with Last Night in Soho, once I got the idea for the film, there were certain songs of that time which I thought that's the perfect song for that movie. And then that movie was gestating in my head for a long time. And it would be the songs that would keep me excited about making it. So there's a song in the movie by the Graham Bond organization, a cover of Wade in the Water. And whenever I would hear that song, I would think about the scene in Last Night in Soho, very similar to the finished scene. And that image in my head and that song choice were rattling around for years before I wrote a single word of Last Night in Soho. In other times, say with Baby Driver, I would be writing the script and then I would get to a point where in that film, there's a different song for every single scene. And if I didn't have a song, I'd think about the scene that I was about to write and I would try and find the right song. Sometimes with Baby Driver, I would think how long the scene was roughly going to be page-wise and I'd find a song that was that length. There's an instrumental by the Beach Boys, Let's Go Away For A While, which is in Baby Driver. And I sort of arrived at that song by running time alone. I mean, I loved the song, but I was thinking, I need like a great two minute instrumental. Ah, this is perfect. So sometimes it works like that. I mean, a needle drop means a song that in the edit, people used to literally drop a needle on an album to find the right track to go with a scene in a TV show or a scene in a film. Um, strangely like, 2001 is essentially a needle drop film because all of those pieces of classical music were ones that the editors tried in the edit suite. They say, what about this? What about this? Originally, that film was going to have a score by Alex North and the score got canned because Kubrick fell in love with all of the classical music needle drops that they used in the edit. And when I was making Spaced, that was a show where there was no music supervisor so I used to find songs that I liked and then go to the Virgin Megastore when it still used to exist around the corner and go looking for tracks that might work in the context of space. So in that case, I was doing the needle dropping myself. We've got a scene, it's like, what about this track? What about this track? What about this track? More recently, I know what song I want to use before I go into it. And very rarely does something change after the fact. There was one song in Baby Driver where we changed the song after we had filmed the scene. And that was because I got slightly irritated by the original song. And here's another thing, don't use a song in a film unless you're okay with hearing it a thousand times. Because if a song in any way annoys you, you're gonna have to listen to it so many times. And this song started to get on my nerves and I started to try and figure out a way to find another song with the same tempo that would perfectly fit the scene, which is what I did.